Minister, it's always a joy to see you. And I remember when you and I met in Glasgow, we just connected right away. We had the same uh, idea about the need to solve global food problems. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to be able to sit down with you today and talk about what we are doing and what we expect to do together. It's always such an inspiration to hear what uh, the African Development Bank has planned for African food uh, security and African agriculture. When we met a year ago, um, the numbers of hungry people in Africa was rising mm. and had been rising for a few years. So the crisis has been there for a long time, but with the war in Ukraine, it has gotten mm. so much worse and we have no time to waste. People dying of hunger in year 2022, it is totally unacceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's a moral imperative to step up. Absolutely. And you know, this is a crisis that came up also on top of the COVID-19 crisis, mm -hmm. which we're still all trying to deal with. All of a sudden, you know, Russia invaded Ukraine and boom, you know, we have uh, food price inflation, we have energy uh, prices going up, we have food security threats all around the world, in particular in the case of Africa. Mm -hmm. You know, we actually, I was surprised actually that Africa imported, um, depending on 31% of all its maize imports on, mm -hmm. on Ukraine, a small country, we are continent to 1.3, 1.4 billion people. And so that, that kind of sent a lot of uh, shocks to us. You know, we, we, the continent will lose, uh, as a result of that war, about, I think, 30 million medical tons of food that will be coming. There will be maize, there will be rice, there will be soybeans, mm. and, and so on. So I think the, if there's anything that I saw from that is mm. something actually happened so far away, he said, but it had so much reverberation all across Africa. And so we decided that this crisis must not create uh, food price inflation or crisis in Africa. And so we decided to do something about it mm. at the African Development Bank, as you know. Mm. And so, yeah. And this crisis has shown how vulnerable this global food system is. Mm -hmm. I think it's absolutely crazy that Africa imports foodstuffs of, what, 30, 40 billion US dollars a year, mm -hmm. when Africa could be the breadbasket of uh, their own continent, and the rest of the world, for that I like, sake. I like that. <laughs> and that's your plan. Yes, and absolutely. And that's why I'm so enthusiastic you. about uh, your programs. Because, Thank you know, um, with uh, stepping up on agricultural production and aquaculture, food, nutritious food for uh, the African people, you also create jobs. So, you know, you, we can <clears throat> eliminate hunger we can um, create jobs in the value chains in agriculture for a growing population and you know new generations of young people mm -hmm. who need hope they need work and you know uh, 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 new sectors that can provide exciting jobs for the future absolutely you know and the thing that i like what you said about africa's potential to produce food you know we've got 400 million hectares of land mm -hmm. that's actually available in africa fantastic land and, um, you know, Africa has no business importing food. In fact, Africa should be a solution mm. to global food issues. You know, Africa may not be able yet to manufacture airplanes, but I can tell you Africa must be able to fill all the airplanes with food. And that's why when the crisis hit and we decided at the African Development Bank to launch the African Emergency Food Production Facility, which is uh, to produce, uh, support 20 million farmers in Africa, uh, to produce 38 million metric tons of food, and that would be wheat, mm -hmm. rice, maize, and, and soybean, valued at $12 billion. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember when I, when, I, when, I, when I talked about this, you know, people were like, well, how are you going to make sure that happens very quickly? Well, I said, we didn't develop this in our heads in our offices. We actually developed it based on what the bank, the African Development mm -hmm. Bank, has been doing on the ground in a number of countries, some of which you know very well. Mm -hmm. you know, for example, you look at the situation in uh, Ethiopia. Mm. Uh, we have provided Ethiopia with drought tolerant um, uh, wheat varieties, mm -hmm. which has transformed the whole Amazing. country. In just two years, they became self sufficient in wheat production. Mm. You know, their area cultivated went from 5,000 hectares in 2018, where we started, mm. to 645,000 hectares That's today. That's impressive. And next year, Minister, they will be totally um, become a net exporter of wheat to Djibouti mm -hmm. and, to, and, to, and to Kenya. So if we've done it for that, we certainly can do it for the long haul. Exactly. Yeah. And you know, I think the world needs 
hope. They need to see that there are actually solutions out there and you are providing a solution. Yes. Uh, so what we need now is for all leaders around the world to step up. And you know, African leaders have said this for a long time. Yeah. They want investments in producing their own food, providing food and jobs for, for their people. So we need to start listening. And you deliver, you deliver the programs. Now uh, we have to deliver on investment. No, absolutely, uh, uh, Minister. You know, the, the, the beauty about the facility is we try and look at what exactly it will do for Africa. Mm. And we said, look, speed matters, you know, because it's a time of crisis. I've got to act and deliver very fast. Mm. It's a facility we set it up. It's worth $1.5 billion. Mm. And um, I'm so proud of the bank, our board of directors, our shareholders, my staff. You know, in 45 days, we had actually approved operations worth $1.13 billion for 24 countries. It's, it's a remarkable speed. Mm. And by the end of this month, we'll have done 35 countries. Mm. And so that is 20 million farmers getting access to drought tolerant crops growing at scale. Um, and it will produce food worth $12 billion. And so my own conviction is when I remember when I called you and I, and I said, uh, Minister, we're going to do this. You said, yeah, <laughs> Let, let's go. Uh, uh, let, me, let me say that. Uh, I've always been a great admirer of Norway. Uh, Norway, of course, is the largest producer of, of urea in the world. We Yara have been there. And, and as you may know, I'm also a Yara Prize winner many years ago. I know. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so Norway has always been at the front mm. end of producing food. So mm. let me thank you very, very much for the support that you've given. Mm. But more than that, it's the way in which you were changing the international development landscape for Norway and also in the Nordic countries by saying Africa needs to be supported to produce its own food. Mm. Africa needs to be supported to get access to climate resilient technologies. Mm. And Africa needs to be supported to become, as I said in the beginning, a net exporter of food. We want Africa you know, to become a solution to global food crisis, not, not, not going exactly. around with, with balls in hand asking for food. <laughs> Absolutely not. We need seed in the ground, not balls in the hand. And you know what I like the most about your program? Yeah. Is that you reach the small scale farmers. Yes. Because we know that the farmers, the small scale farmers in Africa, although they, pr they produce food, they are the most likely to go hungry. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure that they can produce enough for themselves, but also enough to sell for their neighbors, for their community. And uh, you said 20 million farmers. Yes. That's a lot of food and that's a lot of lives yes. being improved. Absolutely. And mo most of those are going to be women. You know, women actually produce more food. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the, the big part of it is we often talk in terms of how much food is produced. But we also have to link that to income for households. Mm -hmm. You know, when women have more incomes, mm -hmm. they take care of their kids, nutrition improves for the household. They send their kids to school. They mm -hmm. can build a better house. Mm -hmm. They can live and have a better life. So it's not just food. It's actually having better lives. And I'm very, very excited about, about that. But, you know, the other thing we've got to do now is we've got to move from the emergency phase to a structural phase. Exactly. Right? And we know that we have to produce food in a smarter way in the future. And that we have discussed as well. Um, yes. You know, climate smart uh, ways of producing food for the future that we have to provide for African farmers as well. Absolutely. And of course, you know, the, the thing is when you take a look at the next crisis that's going to happen in the world, mm. um, Africa is not going to be caught again um, without being ready. You know, when COVID-19 happened, Africa wasn't ready. Mm. But I said, you know, when it comes to food, we are ready. Africa is not going to have a food crisis. But we are going to build on this particular mm. effort and make sure that we actually develop the whole value chain that you and I talked about it for Africa to make sure Africa can not only produce food, mm. but get its private sector mm -hmm. processing food, mm -hmm. adding value to food, having good, good logistics so that Africa can be a global player in the food and agriculture market, you know? And create by, jobs absolutely. for new generations yes. of young people young who people. need hope. Yes. And you know, by 2030, one of the things that actually amazes me is that the, the value of food and agriculture in Africa, you know how much it's going to be worth? A whopping $1 trillion. So $1 trillion, trillion dollars by 2030. So if anybody is trying to actually make money, yeah. right? A young person. That's a great investment. That is the place to be, <laughs> right? You know, we got a lot of oil, 
We've got a lot of gas, but nobody smokes oil. I mean, it drinks oil and nobody smokes gas, but everybody eats food. Yeah. So food is a, is a mega business, but we want to make sure it works. I agree with you for smallholder farmers, mm. works very well for the youth. And we want to make sure you also we use it mm. to transform our rural areas, rural economies. Because that's the thing, you know, the agricultural sector can be a motor in that transformation that Africa Absolutely. needs. Absolutely. Uh, uh, eradicating hunger, yes. creating jobs. Yes. Uh, and at the same time, you know, uh, becoming more robust uh, for uh, changing climate. And you know, one thing that you and I have to do is we have to launch our campaign together to go get young people to get into agriculture. You know, uh, I love wearing bow ties. Mm. And I think I like telling the young people that agriculture is very cool. And so we got to make sure that we also get a lot of younger people into agriculture. Hi, hi. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So... So when the, when the crisis hit and we were getting all of, um, very worried about Africa, we decided at the African Development Bank to set up the African Emergency Food Production Facility. And it's um, at $1.5 billion. The goal pretty much is to produce um, 38 million metric tons of food mm. and support 20 million farmers, majority of those who are going to be women, mm. to produce wheat, maize, rice, and soybeans, valued at $12 billion. That will allow Africa to avoid a food crisis they're managing from this war mm -hmm. in, the, in Ukraine. And one of the things that I actually wanted to say to you about this is that, you know, Africa will lose roughly 30 million metric tons of food coming from Ukraine and Russia because yeah. of this war. But we're going to produce 38 million exactly. metric tons of food. So which means that actually there is a, that's a lot of benefit in the crisis in the sense mm -hmm. that it, it actually wakes us up to know that we can actually produce a lot of food. And you know what? I think... I think uh, the world wants to hear about the solutions because right now there is a lot of, uh, uh, we need hope. Yes. Uh, we are troubled in this mm. world today and we need to see the solutions. And here you have one solution that actually can make a difference for millions of lives, save yeah. millions of lives and transform them. Uh, and and uh, I think that, you know, uh, citizens of the world, yes should push their leaders and talk more about food security. That has been a neglected, neglected uh, uh, um, uh, topic for many years. Uh, people have died from hunger yes. for many years. The numbers have been increasing for many years. Now with the war in Ukraine, we finally get the world to talk about it. So let's give them the solution. Yeah. And let's make sure that the, the leaders of the world step up. Absolutely. And, you know, when you take a look at kids, the thing that breaks your heart the most is stomachs are not made for it to mm. go rumbling, right? Mm. It's made so that there's going to be food in it, mm. but also nutritious food. Mm. And also linking that uh, to the fact that, you know, the brain cells, exactly. you know, you and I are talking, you know, and uh, we're both smart people, uh, but our brain cells develop very, very well. And when kids don't have nutritious food, of mm. course, their brain cells don't develop very well. And that's why I say, you know, we can build roads, you know, we build, we build ports and things like that. We've got to start building gray matter infrastructure, making sure that we produce nutritious food mm. and support women, you know, lactating mothers to be able to do that. And I think that what the global citizens are saying, you are a global citizen from Norway. From Norway. I'm a global citizen from Nigeria mm. and based in Abidjan, you can understand. But we are all voices, we're joining our voices with those of others around the world to say, we got to make sure that we have global food security. Mm. We've got to make sure that people are eating nutritious food. Mm. We've got to make sure that we reduce obesity. Mm. We have to make sure that stunting and wasting, we get rid of those. But more than anything else, as you said, you've got to make sure that we create hope for rural economies of Africa, mm. where almost 75% of the population live, and their future for their kids for their own generations to come, actually depends on what happens with agriculture. Mm. So it's not just food, but it's using agriculture as a transformation engine mm. to change these economies in rural areas from zones of economic misery that they are today mm. to zones of economic prosperity. Mm. And I think that's what the global citizens will really be mm. great you, to be doing together. I couldn't agree more. You know, if, if a child uh, is not given nutritious food, uh, before the age of five, yes. he or she will never reach the full potential um, uh, physically or uh, mentally. So that robs them of 
their life, mm -hmm. of all their hopes. I mean, it's it, what 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 can be more important than making sure that you know kids can actually grow up and and live their potential. Um, and sometimes I'm trying, you know, I'm trying to to think about how it would be to be a mother, mm. knowing that I cannot put food in my children's stomach. What can be more important than giving, you know, uh, mothers of Africa the tool to 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 feed their children? Absolutely. Uh, without without food, there is nothing. Yes. You know, from my point of view. Um, making sure that people have food, it's its number one priority. Without food, there really isn't uh, much else. There's no life. There is no life. <laughs> There's no life. There are no economies. So anyway, to our advocacy on that, we do a high five. High five. High five. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. You know, we're in an environment that we have to really change because mm -hmm. Climate change is pummeling the world. It's also pummeling Africa. I'm not going to even go into the statistics because it's too, it's too big mm -hmm. numbers. But three things just to keep in mind is that Africa is suffering. Africa it needs resources to be able to adapt to climate change. Mm -hmm. And the world needs to meet its commitment towards developing countries in Africa to meet climate change. I just got back from Cabo Verde. Mm -hmm. And Cabo Verde, I saw that it, they, they were there. For the last five years, they've never had rain. In fact, the first, when I arrived, it was the first time it had rain. And the president said, what do you think? Mm. Maybe I should come more often, right? You have vast area of the Sahel that's actually with desertification. You have Africa that is heating up faster than the rest of the world. And so we got to make sure that Africa, that accounts for no more than 3% mm. of global green, you know, gas, I mean, um, carbon emissions, mm. suffers disproportionately from the negative consequences of that. You know, today, we lose seven to fifteen billion dollars a year in Africa as a result of climate change. If that doesn't change by 2030, it will be fifty billion dollars a year. And so we didn't cause the problem. But now, from farmers, from getting access to water, you know, to 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 pastoralists, are now in a deadly conflict with farmers as a result of climate change. So, Africa has no choice but to adapt to climate change. But it cannot adapt alone. The world needs to support it because the amount of financing that Africa needs to, to, to actually support climate change, it's probably about, it needs additional, at least $125 billion a year up to 2030. And so I think when we talk about climate adaptation, we must put Africa priority because mm -hmm. Africa suffers the most. It's the most vulnerable, vulnerable, but it doesn't have the resources to adapt to what it didn't cause. The climate crisis is the existential threat that we are facing, but we need to remember that it is already a reality mm. for so many people, uh, in, poor, in, in, in uh, especially in, in Africa mm. and in uh, other continents. And we, um, we uh, sometimes we, we, we talk a lot about mitigation in mm. the Western world, uh, and we need to mitigate to reduce future consequences, but the climate crisis is already in effect in many African countries. And I think it's so important that we deliver on climate adaptation. We talk a lot about climate financing, but we need to talk about financing specifically to adaptation. And you know, we are moving into a new COP, COP27. Mm -hmm. It's the African COP and African leaders are saying to uh, uh, us politicians in Europe, mm -hmm. uh, in America, deliver on your pledges, deliver on your promises. Um, and I, I've, I, I've said that uh, Norway is doubling our financing on, on climate, uh, our climate finance before 2026. We will keep our promises. But the most important part of that pledge is that we will triple to climate adaptation. We must not forget climate adaptation. And you and I, uh, Dr. Azucena, yeah. we are very engaged in food security and in agriculture. And that's maybe the sector where you see it first. Absolutely. You know, being a farmer yeah. when the climate is changing is devastating. Because uh, if the rain doesn't come when it's supposed to, 
uh, if the rain comes too hard and washes away the seeds and you are a poor farmer and you are standing there and you have put all mm. your resources into the ground and it disappears. You know, I like prayers, but when I look at Europe and I look at the US, farmers go out and they have certainty that they can plant their mm. crops. They have irrigation to plant mm. their crops. If there's a disaster, they get compensated for that disaster. Mm. But in Africa, actually, you go out and the farmers look up because they're not sure it's going to rain. Even if it rains, they have problems also because it rains too much and the damage is too much. And so that's why, you know, congratulations on what you're doing, tripling your support for climate you know, finance. And I think that's the kind of leadership kind and commitment yeah. that is adaptation that's mm -hmm. needed. For us at the African Development Bank, you know, we're doing exactly the same. Mm -hmm. When I was elected president of the bank, you know, and one year after in 2016, we were committing only 9% at that time mm -hmm. of our finance, of our, of our resources to climate finance. You know, by within two years, by 2018, I had moved that to about 38%. Mm -hmm. Today, we commit to adaptation, I mean, to climate finance, we're now 41% to, uh, of, of our total resources going to climate finance. But on the adaptation one, which is the big problem for Africa, you know, the UN Secretary General said that everybody should try and do 50% for adaptation and 50% for mitigation. Well, the fact is the African Development Bank today, we devote 67% of our total of climate finance to adaptation, which is the highest to be found of any multilateral financial institution mm in the world. And so that is the reality. And so to move that forward, you know, we are working very closely with this Global Center for Adaptation on the what is called the African Adaptation Acceleration Program, which is Africa's program, mm. is the most ambitious, boldest effort mm. on adaptation ever in Africa to mobilize $25 billion of financing for, 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 for global uh, adaptation uh, finance for, for, mm. for Africa. So I think the key really is to make sure that we, we have the programs, we have the, we have the plans mm. for the countries. But you know, all that's needed is money, money, exactly. money. The finance is critical. Otherwise, those mm. plans don't matter. Yeah. You know, as Minister of International Development in Norway, I say financing development and financing uh, for, clim uh, the, uh, for climate, it goes hand in hand. Mm -hmm. It's two sides of the same coin. And uh, climate adaptation needs to be a top priority uh, because this is what Africa needs. Uh, so, you know, the African Development Bank is responding to the urgent calls from African leaders. Uh, and now it's, it's really uh, urgent that the rest of the world does the same. And, and, and thank you for your great support uh, as Norway and also the rest of the Nordic country as well as all of our shareholders to our efforts to help the least developed countries, mm. in particular the most fragile states that depend on concessional financing from the bank. We call them the African Development Fund Finance States, so the ADF, mm. we call it mm. states. But there are 37 of them. I know Minister was actually quite amazing about this, and it's, it's, it's quite heart-wrenching, is that nine out of the 10 most vulnerable countries mm. to climate change in the world exactly. are in sub-Saharan Africa, 100% of them depend on the African Development Fund's concessional financing. And so, and that's why, you know, in the 16th replenishment of the African Development Fund, we've opened a, a climate action window to actually help them to mobilize up to $13 billion. Mm -hmm. And the key thing is, why? Well, they can't get access to global climate finance. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. Two, they are facing extreme heat, extreme weather events. They are facing a lot of refugee movement because of climate and all of that. Mm. So what will the $13 billion do? Mm. It will, for example, help 20 million farmers to have access to climate resilient mm. agricultural technologies. There will be an additional 20 million farmers that will also have access to weather index uh, mm -hmm. insurance products so they mm. can insure themselves against this uh, risk events. There will be 1 million hectares of degraded land that is uh, also upgraded. And we expect to provide water for 18 million mm. people. And, you know, water, it's going to be critical. And then we are going to also provide about 840 million uh, metric cube of, of water uh, for people and almost 10 million people with access to electricity. Mm. And so this climate action window is it for mm. COP27. Mm. So when you were talking about we have to land in Sharm el-Sheikh mm. with concrete stuff on the ground, 
the climate action window is the practical instrument to be able to finance these 37 countries that are the least emitters, mm -hmm. but that are the most highly vulnerable to that. And I would very much appreciate your support and that of all the ADF donor countries for that mm -hmm. as we come to this Sharm el Sheikh, make sure we land for climate finance for them because they need it to be able to mm -hmm. exist, you know, the stress is too much for them. Climate uh, financing for climate adaptation is a top priority for Norway because we know that's what Africa needs. And you know, in my country, in Norway, we have weather forecasting, we have all the infrastructure in place mm -hmm. for uh, extreme weather events. Then when the events occur, people have insurance, yes. we have uh, uh, services in place from uh, you know, public services taking care of, 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 of the effects. Now, the LDCs, the least developed countries, they have none we'll of have this. That. That's why Norway also wants to invest in infrastructure, in weather forecasting, in you know, building the capacity uh, and the resilience of the least developed countries to be able to, um, uh, uh, to confront the extreme weather that we know will come. Uh, because it's, uh, it is simply unfair. Yeah, and I, and that I, the countries yeah. who have done least suffer to put most. us in a climate crisis are the ones that suffer the most. I, you know, and I and I really like the words you talk about the issue of insurance in, in Norway and all the developed countries. You know, we, we have a program that's actually quite exciting in Africa, which is called Africa Disaster Risk Insurance Facility mm -hmm. that tries to do that. It's not about ten countries. So one example was you know we when Madagascar had her, um, cyclone Bisrai, we devastated the country. You know, the African Development Fund provided $2 million to ensure Madagascar against that catastrophic risk event. Mm. And guess what? They were able to get up to $12 million mm. of payout, which allowed them to compensate 600,000 farmers that, you know, lost all their Imagine crops. Imagine what that means Yes, for exactly. Farmers. Yes, mm. yes. And so that's the kind of thing that we want to scale up with the climate adaptation um, window, climate action window of the African Development Fund that, mm. that we are talking about. Mm. You know what, Dr. Zina? I think I think we should try to uh, uh, contribute to making the COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh uh, an adaptation forum, an event for really raising climate adaptation issues. I fully agree. I think that the success of Sharm el Sheikh COP27 depends on the money being on the table, mm -hmm. right, uh, to get this done. You know. Everybody's been talking about the, 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 the $100 billion a year that developed countries have promised to provide for developing countries. As you know, that has not been realized. And, and so I, I feel sometimes that mm. we have a lot of megawatts of talk mm. um, that, doesn't, that leads to zero financing for climate finance. So we've got to make sure that we translate that. Let's into walk tech. the talk. Let's walk the talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.